Good evening. My name is Alex Halliday, and I'm uh, Dean of the Columbia Climate School and Director of the Earth Institute. It's great to be connecting with you all out there. We've got a large number of people tonight, and we're here today to talk about escalating heat crises in our, welcome, in our world, so welcome. Uh, as Earth's climate warms and heat waves become more frequent and severe, uh, there's going to be a, a, a variety of things that happen. Uh, one, of course, is we're going to have drought, uh, and that sets in motion conditions for wildfires. Uh, we're going to have crop failures, but also there's going to be heat uh, effects that, in terms of our cities and what it's like to actually live in them. The energy grid is going to be struggling, maybe. Uh, there are all kinds of aspects you need to be thinking about in terms of how we live in a warming world. Tonight, we welcome three of Columbia's preeminent experts in this area uh, who work on the topic of climate, health, and heat. They are also at the forefront of exploring solutions to prepare our homes and our world for this warming future. First, we have Diana Hernandez, and she is an associate professor of socio-medical sciences at Columbia's Mailman School of Public Health. She works to create healthier environments in traditionally low-income neighborhoods. Diana's research underscores the disproportionate impacts our changing climate is having on low-income communities, communities of color, and the medically vulnerable. Bradley Horton is a Lamont research professor at Columbia University's Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory. His research focuses on climate extremes, tail risks, climate impacts, and adaptation. Radley was a convening lead author for the third national climate assessment. He has a unique talent for explaining to the media the risks and solutions around climate change. I say the media, he also explains it to the United States government. And Cecilia Sorensen is the director of Columbia's Global Consortium on Climate and Health Education, based at the Mailman School of Public Health. She is an emergency medicine physician investigator in climate change and health. Cecilia served as an author for the US Fourth National Climate Assessment and as a technical advisor for the Lancet Climate and Health US Policy Brief. Thanks all of you for joining us. This is a very distinguished panel and I'm sure you're all clapping out there in cyberspace. So today we're gonna to kick off with some uh, uh, questions to our panel and I usually kick off just simply um, this, this panel discussion with a few questions about what got people into the field of interest. But just to say at the end, we'll be doing Q&A from the audience. So hold on about probably about five to the hour, we'll, we'll switch over to Q&A from the audience and we'll be taking stuff um, in, uh, but I'll be, I'll be handling those questions. So before we jump in properly, let's start off with each of you may be giving us a brief description of your work and what drew you what drew you into this particular field of, of study. Let's start off with you, Diana. Uh, good evening uh, to you, Alex, and to the fellow uh, my fellow panelists, and and obviously to all of you in the audience. Um, so I am uh, obviously on faculty at the School of Public Health. I come to this work as a sociologist and as someone who was primarily interested in issues around housing and household energy as determinants of health. Um, in some ways it was doing work in communities and actually in people's homes that helped me to realize that energy is um, indeed an issue that uh, people are facing. So much of the emphasis on uh, the kind of energy, health, poverty, housing nexus is focused on heating um, and on, you know, kind of cold weather. But in fact, because of climate change, uh, there really is this kind of shift to, uh, to cooling um, and to the issues around um, hot homes uh, and the kind of health impacts of uh, extreme heat um, as they're kind of uh, as it's uh, as it connects to the home environment and where poverty kind of comes in is that a lot of those conditions are often kind of uh, manipulated um, via uh, the energy system uh, through heating and cooling systems in particular and that's really difficult if affordability is kind of forefront um, on your mind and so uh, a big part of what I've done is characterize 
the phenomenon of energy insecurity to describe how um, low-income households have particular difficulties in meeting their energy needs and how that interfaces with a changing climate um, and uh, specifically with um, extreme heat. Thanks, Diana. Radley, what about you? you? Tell us about your climate modeling world has actually been heavily influenced by your background as a social scientist, right? Yeah, well, I'd say a liberal arts background for sure. Um, as, a, as an undergrad, uh, I studied like development studies um, and, and sort of environmental policy really more than, than science. And then shortly after college was fortunate enough basically just to have a chance to, to travel and spend a lot of time in the global south which I think helped me um, to get a little bit of an understanding about vulnerability and kind of diversity of goals and, and, and perspectives that then I think has helped me a lot later when I went on to graduate school in climate science and really started to think about not just climate change and its impacts, but the interaction between those climate changes with other environmental stressors and with sort of different cultural contexts around the world and this, and this history of Really, oppression um, that's that, that sort of shapes so many of these these interactions. Um, so yeah, I think you know, as a climate scientist, there are climate scientists out there with a deeper training than I in sort of physics and science who are going to make more breakthroughs in terms of our kind of theoretical understanding. But I think I've benefited from that social science background and maybe having a little more of a lens that gears me towards thinking about the impacts of, of climate across sectors of, of society and maybe helps me a little bit with what we call kind of co-production, talking to communicate communities, working with them to, to, to sort of um, uh, frame solutions and even sort of pose questions that are at that interface between what science can provide and what communities, community knowledge and community needs. Great. Cecilia, how about you? You're a physician, and and have you always been interested in climate in particular? Not in particular, and I, you know, it's a it's a kind of funny place to be as a physician in this world because I'm not a climate scientist, so I'm a little oddball out here. And then as a physician, people say you study climate change. What? So it's a uh, I walk this funny world, but you know, Alex, um, I trained at Denver Health in the emergency department, and we used to call summer trauma season um, because we would just get inundated with with patients, right? And this was a safety net hospital in a busy city. And um, it wasn't just trauma, right? It was people coming in with heart attacks, people coming in with asthma exacerbations, um, but we were busy in the summer. And, you know, we had this we have this expression, emergency medicine, you know, when it gets really busy, we say, it must be a full moon out tonight, right? Or something, something superstitious. And, you know, when you sort of step back at that, you say, well, it's, it's not the full moon. It's the fact that, you know, the climate is changing and that we are not adapted to be able to deal with it from a health perspective. And we're seeing more and more impacts stacking up in emergency departments, right? Because everybody in some way is vulnerable. We are all affected by climate and by heat. And I think we're here today to talk about heat. So that was where I sort of got interested in climate change. Um, and since then I've done a lot of work um, sort of in the field, seeing how this plays out in different scenarios. So for example, looking at uh, the mortality following Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico, right? That was um, dubiously undercounted. Um, what really happened there, you know, kind of doing the, doing the autopsy of these climate situations and seeing how they're impacting health systems as well as the health of communities. And so my work is really trying to understand how impacts are occurring so we can come up with better procedures and guidelines um, and be more prepared um, for, for the realities that, that we're dealing with on a daily basis. So thank you, it's a pleasure to be here. Great, fantastic to have you all. So let's start with the Radley. Do you wanna set the stage for us? Um, tell us about the climate statistics, how bad things are and uh, climate extremes and, and how maybe how bad they're likely to get. Yeah, so um, you know, since the start of the Industrial Revolution, we've been responsible for greenhouse gases um, like carbon dioxide increasing by over 40% now due to our activities, especially the combustion of fossil fuels and these large land use changes. Um, and really that's had a broad set of impacts. It's not just global warming, right? We're seeing sea levels rising, something on the order of almost a foot um, a century. We're seeing acidification um, in the oceans. We're seeing changes in what we call the phenology, right? The timing of the onset of spring, you know, major impacts across ecological uh, systems. So it's a diverse set of impacts, including on all types of extreme events. But yeah, really, again, honing in on temperature um, and getting to heat waves, you know, our, our, our topic for tonight. 
most fundamentally, climate change has caused the global average temperature to warm by about two degrees Fahrenheit um, just in the last several decades. Now, one could be forgiven for thinking two degrees Fahrenheit, that sounds like nothing, right? Look at the day-to-day -day temperatures that we, we experience. But one of the key takeaways is that a little bit of change in global average temperature has an enormous impact. So that two degrees Fahrenheit of warming can help explain why all of the warmest years on record have happened extremely recently, like the last seven years, seven warmest years uh, on record. So they've already shifted the statistics. But of course, global average temperature is very esoteric and not particularly meaningful. People and ecosystems are affected by these shorter duration events, like the heat waves we're going to talk about. And we are seeing that heat waves are becoming more intense. Those absolute temperatures are getting higher and higher. They're becoming longer duration, which is going to have a big impact on the ability of people and systems to kind of manage that stress. And they're affecting bigger areas when they happen, which also poses risks to our energy grids and our ability as a society and emergency management, as we'll hear about to cope. So um, we are seeing uh, roughly a doubling in the frequency of heat waves, depending on how you define it. And as we look to the future, the climate models that we use to understand the past, how the system works and project the future are pretty consistent in capturing these increasing global average tens, trends. They also see the big picture of increases in the future and heat wave frequency, intensity, and magnitude. But one thing that worries us is it's becoming clear and clear that they are underestimating the really extreme events. Um, these events like the, the European heat wave, Western Europe of 2022, right? 104 in parts of the UK where we hadn't seen temperatures above 100 Fahrenheit before about 20 years ago, these unprecedented extremes. Another one happened in the Pacific Northwest, US and Canada in 2021, parts of British Columbia experiencing 120 degrees Fahrenheit, not a place that climate models or, or really any climate scientist would have pointed to as an, as an ultra risky area. So there are surprises out there. There are really extreme events in, in terms of heat that are happening faster than our models suggest pointing to key processes that could be missing from our models. And that's just the climate models, as we'll talk about when we start to think about impacts, effects on people, crops, forest fires. Uh, we worry there that our models also lack the imagination, if you will, to, to, to really foresee all the kinds of interconnected things that could happen that are gonna pose a challenge to society. So um, Diana, as you, as you hear or Radley talking like this, what strikes you as the most serious and challenging societal impacts from your point of view? Well, because I, I mean, I guess we all have different vantage points. My vantage point happens to be um, around how this kind of manifests for people, uh, for people that present with various vulnerabilities. Those might be medical vulnerabilities or socioeconomic vulnerabilities. Um, and then also kind of how that manifests well, where they live ultimately um, and in terms of access to energy. And for me, when I hear like the projections, I think, will our energy grids be able to withstand this pressure? Um, and it's not just pressure that is kind of increasing the risk around wildfires and therefore power outages and with power outages come uh, the fact that people won't have access to electric medical uh, devices, for instance, that may be life-sustaining if they're on an oxygen concentrator, for instance. But it, it is also the fact that we now need more energy, which is now also creating pathways for um, more fossil fuel emissions, uh, and, and uh, rather carbon emissions, and what that ultimately looks like for our environment. So there's this kind of, there are all of these pressure points that are happening. So much of it um, from, a, from, the, from the human lens is about mitigating and trying to figure out how to cope with and adapt in the ways that we know how. Um, and that oftentimes means turning the thermostat lower to be more comfortable, to achieve uh, some degree of kind of a healthy indoor temperature. And that is actually not affordable to everyone. So when I think about uh, who has access to air conditioning, um, you, you know, you have elderly households, you have households of color, you have low-income households that don't even have cooling infrastructure in their homes. 
And then when they do have it, they still may face the barrier around uh, ability to pay. Uh, and there aren't really the kind of policy mechanisms that allow for households that present with medical vulnerabilities or socioeconomic vulnerabilities to be able to adapt uh, in ways around these kind of um, bill assistance and energy efficiency upgrades. Those programs exist, but there are many barriers to it. So when I think about what the, the projections that Radley kind of so eloquently talked about, what I think about are those kind of pressure points from an infrastructure perspective, from a housing perspective, and then very specifically from a human side, from the human side, but specifically with uh, attentions to uh, vulnerable populations. So that's great. Um, so Cecilia, Diana's painted a, a really interesting picture from the point of view of, you know, households and how they cope. What about the health impacts direct, more directly? Can you tell us a bit about those? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so when we think about heat, I mean, many of us can sort of say, well, what are the impacts of heat? We say, well, heat stroke, right? When you get really, really sick from heat. And um, that's true. And that's the way I see it, sort of the tip of the iceberg in terms of impacts, right? And those are the things that we, we track data on, right? We say how many heat stroke deaths were there because of this heat wave, right? You know, it gets kind of morbid. But underneath that, that tip of the iceberg, um, we see a lot of other issues that are um, what I call heat sensitive conditions, meaning conditions that people walk around with that, you know, when they're faced with heat can get worse. So an example of that would be heart failure, um, would be people who have underlying cardiovascular disease, people who have underlying um, asthma or, or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, right? These are things that um, get worse when people are exposed to heat. We also know that pregnant women are incredibly vulnerable to heat, that heat can actually trigger preterm delivery, right, which can set the trajectory of, of the child's life in, in a really not good way, depending on what the resource environment is where that where that child is born. Um, so we there are these acute impacts that happen um, with when what Radley was talking about, these extremes, these heat waves that are becoming more and more common, more and more intense and occurring in places that um, we don't have the imagination to realize that they can happen there. So for example, the Pacific Northwest. We also think about sort of the, the chronic kind of indolent risks from heat. Um, so for example, I do work looking at um, a phenomena uh, called chronic kidney disease of unknown origin. And this is a, um, a progressive uh, decline in, in kidney function that we're observing in agricultural workers, predominantly in hot, humid climates. And we're seeing signatures of heat exposure. And what we know is that as a result of, of multifactorial issues, some of them being heat, that we have very young um, male workers who are going into end-stage kidney failure in their 30s or 40s in very low resource environments. So that's one example of sort of these chronic indolent exposure of heat and how it affects human health. We also see big risks to, to labor productivity, right? So we know that, for example, the US lost 2 billion potential hours of work due to extreme heat um, in 2019, and that, that those numbers are going up. And these losses of productivity are primarily occurring in manufacturing and agriculture and in construction sectors. And so I heard a statistic today that if we sort of took the money that was lost from those potential labor hours and we put it towards adaptation, we would have uh, hundreds of millions of dollars that we could be turning towards adaptation when right now we're spending very little uh, on adaptation to these uh, climate events. So I sort of break these impacts um, in terms of health, Alex, down into sort of the acute impacts, the things we see when there's a heat wave, which is, you know, heat stroke, exacerbation of underlying health conditions, and then the more chronic insidious impacts that are happening sort of um, across the spectrum of, of physical health as well as mental health um, and well-being of societies. So this, just say a little bit more about this chronic, like, CDKU, right? So chronic C disease of CKDU, disease. yeah. <laughs> so um, this is this is shown in particular, I guess, in tropical regions, right? The most ex extreme example, and I guess these are the places where there are, the resources are actually less adequate for dealing with it, and this, you know, the, people are not really keeping an eye on each other out in the fields in the same way as they might be in other. I mean, is, are there ways in which these health impacts are actually directly? Um, tied up with the whole issue of um, the social issues as well of, of how well off people are and how well society how well off societies are so that actually the societies that are less able to cope are actually suffering these things more 
Yeah, I would absolutely say so. I mean, in terms of, uh, you know, the public health response in terms of of surveillance, right? Just getting out there in the field and saying, is this happening here? You know, we know yeah. that chronic kidney disease of unknown origin is happening um, throughout Central America. We believe it's also happening in Sri Lanka and in India. We suspect it's happening in Africa and many other places. Um, we don't have surveillance intact to be able to detect this um, and, and detect it early enough that we can actually um, change the course of that individual's disease. Because once you, as you alluded to, once you sort of get to end stage organ failure, your only choice is dialysis. And that is very expensive. And there's very few dialysis units in, in rural underserved parts of the world. Um, mm. And there's very few other employment options for people who work in, in these agricultural sectors. And so it really starts eating away at the fabric of communities um, yeah. when these impacts occur. So sticking with the social aspects, Diana, let's get back to the, you, you touched on the issue of energy security. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about that and how the energy grid, as it becomes imperiled, becomes an issue um, to to communities and what are the what are the main dangers that you see from this well let me just say a, a few things um i i um, have drafted a book i have a workshop coming up on friday to talk about um what i describe as this kind of um social and public health phenomenon that hasn't really you know kind of it's garnered more attention now certainly than uh when i first started writing about this um, over 10 years ago. Um, but, you know, it really renders people powerless in many ways. And, and that's the kind of going uh, title of the book is powerless. Um, and, you know, ultimately, this is about people feeling and being kind of um, restricted in their movements and in their abilities to kind of live dignified lives because uh, of uh, the kind of physical conditions that they're experiencing and the economic challenges and what that ultimately looks like in terms of health outcomes. So Cecilia mentioned a lot of them, but proximally, right, before people end up in um, in uh, emergency rooms, they're not sleeping well. So they experience poor sleep quality. Uh, many of them might be, um, you know, kind of facing psychosocial stress uh, as a result. So when you compound pregnancy, for instance, with psychosocial stress and extreme heat, then you're really thinking about like all of the kind of adverse outcomes. So as I think about energy insecurity um, and how this kind of connects, surely I'm thinking a lot about uh, affordability, but I'm also thinking about cumulative burdens in certain neighborhoods. Those neighborhoods that are impacted by shade inequalities and urban heat island, and those things kind of being compounded by the fact that um, in homes that haven't been uh, weatherized and retrofitted and aren't really functioning well from an energy perspective, what that actually means in terms of trying to regulate in indoor temperatures. I'm also, um, you know, I mentioned the, the cooling issue. Uh, we did a pretty large scale study with the uh, New York City Department of Health looking at this. Uh, that paper just came out this month um, in the Journal of Urban Health. And again, we found that equipping homes and populations that should otherwise be able to benefit substantially from the appliance itself, uh, these folks are actually unable to turn on their um, air conditioners because of these kind of expenses. So um, those are the, so I think about cumulative burdens on uh, certain populations. I think about uh, the fact that there are some communities that have these kind of adversities that are pretty stacked and they're really historically rooted. That's what makes this a justice issue. It's what makes it an equity issue for all of the reasons why Cecilia was mentioning this from a global perspective. That obviously is something that's also kind of driving migration patterns, uh, you know, people seeking refuge for a lot of different reasons. So it's a really complex set of problems, right? Like one can think this is just about, um, you know, the, the, the thermostat and where it's sitting, but it's so much more than that when you think about the kind of human impact and the social impact and what that looks like when populations are burdened in multiple ways. Um, and when places like actual communities are burdened um, in, you know, these kind of cumulative ways, 
it just it is it is an exacerbator of uh, kind of con the condition, and it also um, is something that kind of sets people on a path to poor health and ultimately uh, to kind of shorter lifespans and and shorter health spans. Yeah. <laughs> so I was going to say, let's be positive. So uh, <laughs> the um, but seriously, I mean, it's fine. This has been great. Let's talk about some solutions now, maybe, or things we can think about that could be done to tackle these problems. And I thought I'd kick off with you, Cecilia, if you could say a little about what the medical community might do to prepare for the consequences of climate change. What is what is your what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, thanks for asking, Alex. <laughs> I think about this a lot, and it, it keeps me up at night. And uh, because we have so many solutions, I mean that is. That is the reality. We know enough now that we can start acting. And right now we have sort of a lot of barriers um, in terms of engaging health professionals. And um, I think that that's a really viable option in order to get messages out to people in places everywhere so they understand what the health impacts are to them personally and to their loved ones and ways that they can protect themselves, right? Um, I pulled numbers from the World Health Organization a couple months ago, and if you count all the doctors, nurses, pharmacists, and dentists, there's over 50 million um, health professionals globally. And so one of, some of the work that I'm doing right now is, is through the Global Consortium on Climate and Health Education, which is based at the Mailman School at Columbia. And we are engaging with deans of schools of um, medicine, nursing, pharmacy, and asking them to pledge to train their health professionals um, because there's so many solutions that we can impart. And additionally, there's so many ways that we can change our practices in hospitals. So for example, when the Pacific Northwest heat wave happened, um, there were so many patients that were coming into the hospital with heat stroke, which is the most deadly form of heat illness. And the treatment for heat stroke is rapid cooling through cold water immersion. What does that mean? It means you have to take a patient who is sometimes not very conscious and immerse them cold water, right? And I don't know if you've been in an emergency room lately. I hope not, but we don't have bathtubs lined up to do this, right? And we actually don't even have protocols to monitor the temperatures, et cetera, et cetera, and all these things that need to happen very, very quickly to prevent permanent injury um, to organs of that person. And so what ended up happening in, in, uh, in Washington is, is someone got the great idea of why don't we go to the morgue and grab some body bags, fill them with ice and water, um, and put the bodies in there. And many people survived because of that. Great, great impromptu solution. Um, I think we can do better, right? I think that if we have preparedness, that we're gonna be able to manage these not so uncommon events in a much uh, more organized fashion and prepare our hospitals to be able to really um, take care of patients to the highest quality standards, to educate our patients, uh, and also for the healthcare system to really lead by example in this space. Because if the healthcare sector were a country and you put us all together, together we'd be the fifth largest emitter of greenhouse gases on the planet. So in addition to doing all this great, you know, good in the communities we serve, we have so many externalities, we do harm and we don't have to, right? There's, there's other ways. And so what I see right now, Alex, honestly, is we have so many deployable solutions um, that need to be scaled up. And so, you know, that's a lot of the work that, that we do at the Global Consortium, um, which I direct. So yeah, that's just so some ideas. Sure. Yeah. Putting patients in body bags may need a bit of media work to sort of get that out carefully here's a message <laughs> anyway it's, it's a yeah. brilliant idea brilliant idea diana tell us about what you think are the policy actions uh, that would be most protective of the most vulnerable populations well you know in new york city um the way that the low income home energy assistance program works um is that people are only able to access um, that bill assistance service if they pay for their own heat, meaning that, um, you know, for, for uh, renters in particular, this is really about like a cold weather bias issue. Um, and most New Yorkers pay for electricity and would pay for their own cooling. So expanding um, that program uh, for the summer months uh, and to be able to cover cooling is a really immediate step uh, that would just kind of um, just requires some legislation. 
Um, I would also say that really focusing on improving uh, the energy performance of buildings is really critical so that people are using less energy and able to achieve comfort more quickly and more efficiently is important. Um, it actually, you know, can improve quality of life and health in so many ways, plus has the kind of, you know, we often think about health as a co-benefit, but if we invest in housing, we have environmental, you know, co-benefits depending on the lens that you're taking. Mm -hmm. uh, so decarbonization in the housing sector, I think is really, really critical. We know that buildings are the second highest emission emitters, um, file, you know, second to uh, vehicular um, sources. And so we know that that's kind of uh, an area and there has been a lot done here in New York City. Uh, local laws have been passed um, to support that. Um, there are lots of initiatives um, and uh, supports for compliance as well. So I think ultimately uh, those are really hopeful places and the low hanging fruit. Um, you know, there's been, um, you know, discussions around expanding cooling centers, for instance, but those cooling centers really have to also work within people's lives. And so part of why, you know, like air conditioning units, not that we want to necessarily promote that, but it's important because not everybody can spend their days in a cooling center, but we want to also kind of expand the um, the types of cooling centers that exist and wh what kind of role they can play in people's daily lives. Um, and then the other thing that I would say is disconnection policy. So people um, are disconnected um, here in New York State. They can be disconnected pretty much any time of the year. Um, and there are a limited set of, um, of uh, protections uh, and those are not universal. Um, they, you know, they really vary by state, uh, and there are certain conditions um, that would render someone uh, kind of um, to have those kind of protections. But I think that those can be expanded. They can include um, well, extreme temperatures, um, and uh, some folks have been working on trying to lower that temperature uh, to be something um, on the order of. Uh, 90 degrees or so. Um, so it's kind of uh, lower than the thresholds, the current thresholds, with our, which are really high. So thinking about heat wave and extreme heat moratoria around disconnections would also be helpful so that in the most extreme weather, people have uh, protections and will have access to energy. Um, that's kind of where I'll, where I'll, I'll kind of leave the discussion. So maybe we should get back to the the, the problems. So this, I mean, this was really great. Here's some positive solutions. But Radley, tell us about climate models because one of the things that's become quite clear is um, I think Catherine Hayhoe calls it global weirding. The weather seems to be behaving in ways that sometimes that are, it seems pretty wacky, and that seems to be part of global warming. To what extent are the climate models actually actually unable to predict what really is going to be happening? Or can you tell us a bit about that right now? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a it's a really interesting question that I think poses a lot of messaging um, challenges. And from to me, the sort of the bottom line is that climate models make it abundantly clear um, that even these sort of simple changes, you know, global average temperature increase in response to greenhouse gases, um, you know, they, they just make it abundantly clear that we're locked into more of these future changes. And we're learning that extreme events increase even more rapidly with a given amount of warming. So the models basically, to summarize, um, make it abundantly clear that we're locked into a lot of additional changes in climate hazards. Um, there's really no way around it. We need to dramatically reduce emissions. That can lower um, the rate at which those extremes will change, and we can adapt and transform society in the face of those changes. But models make it clear um, we're locked into more changes and extremes. But simultaneously, there is, as you mentioned, a lot of concern about what we call these sort of tail risks that for like individual extreme events like heat waves in specific places, um, we our models underestimate just how extreme these events can be. And similarly, there's real concern about what we call nonlinearity, basically the idea that as we turn up the dial a little bit further, Increasing temperatures another degree, greenhouse gas concentrations another 30 parts per million or whatever it is. 
what we call emergent behaviors could start to happen. The past will no longer be prologue. And we worry especially about what we call feedbacks. The idea that when you nudge a system in a certain direction by increasing temperatures, it might respond in ways that themselves can make the problem worse. So mm -hmm. specifically, when we think about these feedbacks for heat waves, it's helpful to really break it into two types. There's processes that are related to what we call the bound, the lower boundary, the land surface or the ocean. And then there's processes related to what's happening in the atmosphere. So one way to think about a heat wave is in terms of that lower boundary, it's more likely to happen if our nearby water temperatures are warmer than usual. That can set the stage for humid heat waves, which are so deadly. Um, and similarly, there's a powerful feedback where, whereby in some regions, if vegetation starts to dry out because of a heat wave, it can change the balance at the surface so that the additional energy coming in goes almost entirely towards further heating rather than say causing evaporation as you might have if you weren't in a hot dry heat wave in the first place. So that's the kind of feedback that can make temperatures even, more, even warmer. And what we're really concerned about are what causes heat waves from an atmosphere perspective. These big high pressure systems with bright sunny skies that you know, let so much heat come in, often accompanied by sinking air, which also causes things to warm more and more. And there's really a lot of concern, I would say, um, with climate change. What are we taking for granted, essentially? We, do we just, without really thinking about it, assume that during summer in a place like New York, more often than not, every several days, a weather system is gonna come through, usually from the West, bringing clouds, bringing low pressure and some rain, which will mix the atmosphere, which will provide some cooling, which will bring some cool air from, from the North. With climate change, is there a possibility that we'll see some shifts in this large scale weather patterns, um, such that we might not be able to bank on those sort of, uh, that relief from low pressure systems as often. It's an unknown, but it's an example of the kind of thing that is plausible and that we're seeing arguably some, some evidence of and why the further we turn up the dial, increasing greenhouse gases, the bigger the risk of some things we haven't really even begun to, complement, to comprehend yet, such as changes in the position and strength of these high pressure systems, which could lead to big shifts in the statistics of heat waves, should they happen. So just stay with us a bit more. Can you tell me a little bit more about thresh, tell us a little bit more about thresholds and in particular uh, whereby things get particularly bad for people and the impacts of climate change? Because uh, people talk about tipping points and they talk about thresholds. I'm never quite clear with health issues or uh, things that are really going to impact people. Where do we see this happening? Are there ways in which you think things could suddenly get particularly much, much worse as a result of of the climate changing. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because you know the example I just gave was entirely sort of in the climate science sphere uh, yeah. in the heat. Waves. But really, we have to think about all these impacts on society, right? And that gets us into the world of modeling of impacts, whether it's kind of statistical approaches or trying to simulate the real processes of, for example, how a human body gets rid of heat or how a crop grows day by day. Um, in the presence of heat uh, and dry air, what causes a forest to dry out, what determines whether infrastructure uh, is usable and, or not under, under a demand profile. Yeah. And there is a lot of concern about thresholds there. So I'll just give you one example, um, wet bulb temperature, this combination of heat and humidity. Um, it's not okay just to look at air temperatures alone. We need to think about the simultaneous humidity because that's what determines the ability of people to cool themselves. And we know that there is, roughly speaking, a threshold out there where for that quote unquote healthiest person imaginable uh, sitting in the shade with an endless supply of water, um, even if they're not exerting themselves, there's a combination of heat and humidity where it's thermodynamically impossible to cool yourself enough uh, by sweating basically to survive. And that's an example of a threshold. Now we could quibble about exactly what that combination of temperature and humidity is, but it exists. Um, so this is the type of thing to worry about because we haven't crossed these thresholds much in the past. And all of those, whether it's observed historical relationships between temperature and mortality, 
temperature and these other health outcomes we we heard about, mm. temperature and cognition, you name it. Um, we haven't really been in the space of extremely high heat and humidity. Um, it's very nonlinear and there's a lot of potential for, for surprises. And the real concern is that real people experience vulnerability at much lower combinations of temperature and humidity. People have these pre-existing health conditions. They're forced to work outdoors, um, whether it's as farm laborers, um, construction workers, you name it. They're young, they're elderly, they're dealing with simultaneous poor air quality. For all these people, the impacts are gonna kick in much, much earlier. So mm -hmm. thresholds exist. They're very helpful for thinking about, um, but the real dangers and effects often kick in way earlier, unless we can use adaptation strategies like air conditioning to push some of those thresholds and reducing poverty to push some of those thresholds um, back out. So those are some of the uh, some of the types of, of of concerns about a lack of imagination, if you will, in our impact models, whether they be crop models or uh, models of how humans can handle heat and humidity. Okay, that's great. Very interesting, um, Cecilia. Tell us about how you feel um, the changes in climate, global warming, uh, are shaping priorities in your work in particular. You know, we we advocate that that health professionals need to understand this. And, you know, I, I've been seeing sort of the trend over the past five years is that, you know, it used to be sort of that like the polar bear and the iceberg is kind of this poster child for climate change. And more and more, I think we're we're starting to shift our lens that it, it's not the polar bear on the iceberg, you know. It's it's children, you know, having asthma exacerbations. It's vulnerable elderly people dying in heat waves, right? And so, you know, I, I think that the dialogue is starting to change. And I think when we frame climate change as a health crisis, which, mm -hmm. which it is, and it's interesting, you know, the most recent um, IPCC report um, came out. And you know, it was called a code red for humanity, right? Code red is that that's that's medical lingo. That's jargon to say, you know, this patient has flatlined, right? Like we need active CPR, right? You know, so so we are seeing this shift to really be thinking about this in terms of health impacts. Um, and but my my concern is that there's this lag between, you know, all the things that Radley can tell us about, you know, tipping points and unexpected and emergence that is not translating um, to frontline um, professionals and, and institutions that have the ability to do something about it, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think, you know, we have the modeling, we have the knowledge, we need to be more rapidly assimilating it into our practice um, so that we can get up to speed with these impacts which are already occurring. Um, I do see some positive signs though, right? I, I see more and more um, people from all sectors who are starting to think a bit about the health impacts. And so that gives me hope. Mm. Yeah, right. So Bradley, let's get back to you quickly before I go on to Diana again. Um, I want to just see, I mean, given these, um, the growing crisis, you know, with unprecedented heat developing, are there ways in which climate modelers and, and people who are thinking about the climate system um, are thinking about solutions? Or is that something that they just think is someone else's job to figure out? Yeah, I think we are uh, starting to try to contribute more to to solutions and recognizing that I especially see that in the younger generation of, of graduate students and, and scientists wanting to engage in in the solutions. I think one of the key things we can do from a communication and, and sort of knowledge providing perspective is to think more about and acknowledge what we call compound extreme events. We got to get out of this perspective of, of viewing individual events in isolation. You know, when we developed in the past climate projections for the National Climate Assessment or for a city like New York, there was a tendency to look one climate variable at a time, um, one location at a time, uh, one event at a time. And in practice, it's way more complicated than that, right? It's, it's multiple variables. It's not just temperature, it's temperature and humidity. It's not just one moment in time. It's, it's, it's what if the heat wave happens right after a hurricane has knocked out power, right? Um, and it's not just one place at one time because a city, any city like New York is affected by heat waves that are simultaneously happening 
all around the globe, which might become more, more common with climate change. What's that gonna do to crop prices um, for our most vulnerable community members who are already struggling with high food prices? What's it gonna do for the ability of, to meet emergency management needs across the country when we're seeing more fires in the West, for example, at the same time we're having those heat waves? So how can we expand a dialogue that, that captures that complexity? It's hard to model in a quantitative way, but it's how things really are transpiring. And it's also the complexity of it's not just climate, right? It's all these other trends we're enduring. COVID crisis, air quality, so many of the things that, that we're talking about. How do we build a more resilient society in the face of these kind of compound extremes? And I think no one's talking enough about that. We certainly can't assure that, assume that our insurers, our reinsurance companies that are supposedly helping to hedge against all these things, have the answers because there's sort of tail risk all, all over the place. So it's, it's disturbing, but the hope is that from a solutions perspective, we can embrace that complexity and leverage some of these tipping points, if you will, towards more, more resilient outcomes and outcomes that get us off fossil fuels in a hurry. Okay, that's great. Well, we could talk about this much more, but I wanted to get back to Diana. Um, Diana, tell us about the Community Engagement Corps. I don't know, tell, explain to everybody what the work and goals are of this organization. Um, so I've played multiple roles. Um, I am actually stepping down from my role as the uh, Community uh, Engagement Corps Director at the, um, uh, it's a center for um, Center for Environmental Health and Justice in Northern Manhattan, and I've been involved uh, with this P30 center um, that is led by uh, Andrea Baccarelli for a long time, uh, and I'm stepping into the role of uh, deputy director of the center. Um, and Ami Zolta um, is stepping in as the director of the Community Engagement Corps. Um, but as someone who's been, uh, you know, kind of uh, working uh, with the center and honestly, um, you know, in the community and with the community embedded in the community uh, for a very long time, part of the goal is, first of all, to be able to appreciate these issues from the perspective of community members. And what does that actually mean? That means that we spend time, that we listen, that we engage, that we validate, that we respect the perspectives of people that may or may not look like those of us that are in the academy. I happen to be uh, a woman of color, of Afro-Puerto Rican descent, who grew up in Section 8 housing in the South Bronx. So my perspective is in many ways informed by the fact that I come from a, a community of need, uh, a, a, a neighborhood that has uh, historically dealt with environmental justice issues that is very much, um, you know, kind of challenged by lack of shade, uh, poor air quality, and decisions that happen again and again around that continue to disenfranchise uh, the community, even when that looks like new investments in luxury housing, because even though that exists, that isn't necessarily to the benefit and for the people that are in that community. So community engagement from the perspective of those of us that are involved in that work is partly about like just opening the spaces for us to have dialogue so that we understand where people are coming from. And truly like in my own work, what I've done is just to respect the fact that people have their own really brilliant ways of coping, adapting and understanding these issues. And that so long as we don't appreciate the, that kind of native uh, those the, that native knowledge, expertise, um, and a, a kind of a synergy in way in the way, way of living. Now we're also missing an opportunity uh, to learn some, you know, kind of something that the models can't show us. Radley, to your earlier point, that like not everything can be quantified in this way, but that there are certain things that really require the kind of personal touch and the interactions for us to like have bi-directional learning and exchanges. Um, and, you know, to, uh, I guess, uh, pivot a little bit, I've taken on a new role at the Center for Global Energy Policy as the co-director of 
the Energy Opportunity Lab, which we are imagining will be an opportunity for people to come together, for practitioners to come together, for community members to come together, for those that are kind of representing different um, sectors to be able to have those kind of conversations that are really essential, not just for what is ultimately an energy future, but what is also about a just transition that we are really embarking on the kind of next generation of energy. We haven't necessarily had this opportunity um, in you know, multiple generations. And here we are with the kind of consciousness around needing to make decisions that are, equi that are equitably focused, that are really kind of about uh, re redress and you know, kind of allowing for what comes next uh, to open up new possibilities for communities that have been disenfranchised historically. Um, and so I, to me, that uh, the, the answer to your question, Alex, is not so much about a particular role. It's really about a perspective and a way of engaging that is really important. And because of my own personal background, I've always very much felt like my work is embedded in community because I'm embedded in community. And nobody could really take that away from me because I don't come <laughs> to the community. I am the, I'm there. I, you know, I live in the community, et cetera. So <clears throat> it's a very different way of approaching the work. This is great. So in a few minutes, we're gonna take um, questions from the audience. Um, but uh, I wanted to give each of you a chance to uh, ask, um, give one, one takeaway message. But before you do that, the takeaway message, I just wanna ask you quickly, if you could say, if there was one policy intervention that you would like to see happen, what would that be? So why don't I kick off with you, Cecilia? Have you got any thoughts of a particular policy intervention you think would might make a difference? That's a great question, Alex. Um, you know, I, I would just say that there's there's so many different ways that we can focus policy on this. And I think that wherever we go, we need to be thinking about co-benefits. Um, you know, one solution has been, let's give everybody air conditioning machines, right? But we know that that requires energy. And then, you know, strains the grid and also causes more heat in streets. Um, so that's a solution that, you know, doesn't actually, that actually worsens the problem, right? Whereas greening infrastructure, so for example, planting more trees um, and other things um, can actually have health benefits and also sort of help draw down carbon from the atmosphere. So as we're thinking about policy solutions, we want to make sure that they're framed um, in terms of co-benefits, right? That we're not creating solutions that create problems <laughs> that we're then going to have to go back and solve, right? Mm -hmm. It's yeah. it's tough because we're in an emergency. And so it's sort of like, oh, quickly, let's, let's get this band-aided up as quickly as we can. But if we don't think through the implications of policy solutions, we're going to end up with more problems. And I think that you know, one frame that I've seen very effective with this is thinking about the co-benefits, right, of, of any policy solution that we're going to put forward. So I can't recommend one yeah. policy, just that we we be mindful um, about not creating problems with solutions. Bradley, what, what would you do as a policy intervention? One quick one. Still, a lot of fossil fuel subsidies are out there, either directly or indirectly. Sometimes it's... Um, concessions to you know mine coal that are absurdly cheap um, even before you include the environmental costs uh, tax incentives that that sort of benefit the use of fossil fuels so you know renewables are catching up or have caught up in terms of cost alone let alone these the, the other co-benefits but they need to be given that chance everywhere to to compete and they're still being held back by subsidies mm -hmm. in, in in a lot of places. Of course, you do have to think about some of those instances where um, the poor, you know, benefit and need some of those subsidies, but find a different way to, to get that to, to, to get that um, subsidy to the poor without um, it leading to more fossil fuel use. It, you know, it, it definitely can be done. Mm 
Diana, what about you? What would be your policy intervention? Uh, I mean, the, the really easy one is like, look, I don't think that we should disconnect people uh, from energy services uh, due to inability to pay. I think we should really figure out uh, a rate structure that allows for uh, poor people to be able to afford their energy. Um, but I think I would love to see like there be some kind of a, sh a cost sharing or energy sharing a mechanism that allows for people that really do kind of like use more energy than they need to, to kind of redistribute that. Um, and Cecilia, to your point, I, I agree with you, right? The idea that, you know, there are people that are using way too much energy and, um, and even from a cooling perspective, like just, you know, like they are overdoing it. But that often, I mean, what what is what is also happening is that there are some people that are not using the energy resources that they need to stay alive uh, or to live healthily. And so like there has to be some kind of balance, but that balance is actually going to be achieved when people that have more uh, are using less. Um, and they're not doing that only because they're they're able to benefit from efficiency, but also because they're a lot more cognizant about their use. And that I give poor people that they really do think about energy use um, in a very particular way because they don't have a choice. Um, and I know, again, my lens is a, a little bit narrow um, when it comes to answering this question, but I do think that inequality aspect, I think, is really critical for us to understand, to appreciate, and to make shifts around. That might be behavioral, but I think that there's also a policy land landscape that can help to support that. So, okay, we've got to wrap this up and go to q and I'll just give you one sentence each. Tell me one takeaway message you'd like to, to give the audience. Cecilia, you kick off. There's hope. <laughs> you know, I, I think there is hope. And I think that you know, as scientists and doctors, we we sort of we we really need to understand the problem because within the problem lies the solution. And the more we can wrap our brains around the problem, the more we can come up with viable solutions. And we need to be able to map this out. But um, I want you to walk away thinking that there's hope that um, the people are working on this, that we're thinking through this really hard, and coming away with saying, look, there's a lot of viable deployable solutions, um, and that climate change is not an all or nothing phenomena. Right? It's it's a gradient. And we we have opportunity to affect um, the trajectory. So okay, great. Hope. That wasn't a sentence. I'm sorry. That's all right. Bradley, one sentence. Tipping points can be positive. They can work in our favor. We are a social species, and when young people decide they only want to work for or invest in companies that are committed to protecting their workers and supply chains from climate change and reducing their emissions, that can lead to rapid change as it will when investors start to refuse to invest in those in those companies that are going to appear more and more stranded. So that that can can and I think will ultimately be the most rapid tipping point and it'll be in our favor as long as we don't lose control of the narrative first. Great. Diana, what about you? You have the last word. Yeah, I think we can't forget the vulnerable. Uh, and I hate, I mean, there's there there are parts of the vulnerability that uh, I find to be a little bit problematic, but if we can all like see ourselves as potentially vulnerable because we all are when it comes to climate change, I think we really have to make sure that uh, folks that are medically and socioeconomically vulnerable um, have a, a proper accommodations and protections. Okay, this is great. So uh, this is going out globally to a lot of people around the world, but there are some questions coming in in the Q&A uh, that are actually related to the fact that we're in New York. And we're gonna kick off with one of those. Um, how do we approach heat wave classifications in areas within a city like New York City, where some temperatures can vary greatly between neighborhoods? Uh, I tend to hear climate models talked about on larger scales rather than a local level. And was wondering if there were more of these fine scale studies to address some of these discrepancies. Who wants to kick off with that? How Let's do we say, local, Maybe I'll local, just- Yeah, you go ahead. A little quickly. So yeah, very true. Increasingly, we have weather stations and citizen science that can help paint a block by block um, uh, picture. Uh, certainly the surface, like literally, the pavement or the building surface 
creates its own micro environment um, as well. So we heard earlier about the importance of shade, um, the importance of thinking about what, what surfaces we have. Those are, those are critical for um, determining the actual exposure that, that, that people have. And it's no coincidence that you see people you know, wanting to live along you know, with the shore, with the sea breeze. All these things are largely still missing from our climate models, but, but very important to determine the, the degree of heat that people are exposed to. But could you actually end up with some kind of an index that quantifies the heat risk in certain parts of the city for people? Yes, and you know, even better if you can build in some of the vulnerability components to that too. Who's yeah. Um, yeah. what's the temperature inside some of those buildings? Um, uh, how much do people have to work outdoors? Do they have pre-existing health conditions? And you're starting to see some of those indices, but I think they can be improved and made finer resolution. I would agree with that, and just add that you know, all public health. All messaging around heat waves has to be layered with, and who's vulnerable, and what can they do, right? Um, because I think a lot of us don't want to see ourselves as being vulnerable. Like nobody wants, to be like I'm vulnerable. No, I'm not. But you know, how how can we sort of help people see what their vulnerabilities are and what they can do about it, right? So I would say we have to sort of tag on that that messaging because you know people who have health vulnerabilities are going to start getting sick way below temperatures that hit a heat stroke or heat, heat alert threshold. And honestly, most of the time, what we're seeing is that health impacts occur on the shoulders of heat waves. Um, mm -hmm. They don't happen during heat waves. Why is that? I don't know. Maybe people realize it's hot, but they don't realize it's hot when it's just pretty hot, not extremely hot. And so there has to be a lot of public health messaging towards vulnerable populations as part okay. of this. Okay, so let's get on to another question. Um, so what can we expect to see regarding the spread of infectious diseases uh, to in terms of higher temperatures? We need Jeff Shaman here. Pretty much the whole School of Public Health is going to be here soon. So uh, uh, would infectious communicable, dis communicable diseases also be more common if the overall temperature rises? Mm -hmm. Who wants to tackle that? Diana, Cecilia? Thanks, Cecilia. This is a good question. For okay. You. <laughs> yeah. I mean, as a result of climate change, I mean, just relevant to New York City, I mean, we're seeing a huge expansion of Lyme disease, um, especially mm -hmm. because, especially in Staten Island, actually, there's there's a really big issue with Lyme disease. And this is because uh, tick populations, it's not getting as cold as you would notice in New York City right now. It doesn't get cold in the winters anymore. And all those tick populations that used to die off are not dying off. And so we're getting exponential tick replication. So this is a huge problem because they're disease carrying organisms. So that's just one local example. I think globally, we're seeing expansion of, of uh, mosquito habitats into places that they weren't formally. So we're seeing huge increases in, in dengue um, as well as in malaria um, in potentially uh, previously unaffected areas. So they're traveling to higher latitudes and also to higher elevations. Um, and so, there's lots of different ways. There's also concern about increasing antibiotic resistance because um, if ever, anyone who's done a science experiment, you know, when you uh, when you warm something up, when you especially bacteria, they replicate faster up to a up to a certain temperature. But as bacteria replicate faster, they develop resistance faster. And so there's lots of different aspects related to infectious disease right. yeah. and climate change and heat. Amazing. So uh, this is one for you, Diana. Um, heat pumps. Uh, so people are uh, looking at heat pumps as a solution. Uh, and they're increasingly they're being seem to be being used increasingly uh, within New York City, but the scale up needs to be much faster by the sound of it. Do you want to say a little bit about whether they're seen as a really viable solution to some of the problems we're talking about? Yeah, so uh, a level set with uh, saying that heat pumps uh, provide heating and cooling. Um, and for the most part, they're pretty reliable, pretty efficient. Um, they have some limitations when it comes to extreme temperatures, both extreme cold and also uh, extreme heat, you know, kind of far out. Uh, but they are kind of electricity based um, and they do provide an opportunity to shift away from natural gas and heating oil, et cetera. Um, and so uh, with the ban around natural gas um, and new construction, uh, that is kind of a, you know, it, it will become the default in many ways in terms of the heating and cooling systems and buildings. But the real challenge is not necessarily a new construction, which, you know, is held to certain building codes and standards that are much higher and based on 
uh, a, a level of efficiency that is kind of less polluting um, and less of a source of kind of emissions. Now, the real challenges in existing buildings and not just existing buildings and older buildings and not just in older buildings but in older buildings that haven't been retrofitted in quite a bit of time and so that really is the profile of New York City's uh, building stock for the most part um, and so the uptake has to be much higher we definitely need a lot more kind of opportunities for efficient heating and cooling um, and equipping homes with uh, with cooling options, um, you know, again, in the largest and in, 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 you know, kind of the, the lead from a legal perspective, from a policy perspective, uh, a lot is done around ensuring that people have uh, heating in their homes, but not so much on the cooling front, uh, but the need to accelerate uh the retrofitting of heating and cooling systems uh in new york city buildings is an enormous task um and it will take quite a bit of time for us to really achieve uh the levels of efficiency that are necessary for us to like kind of make a dent and be on you know the kind of trajectory that bradley would approve of um and so um yeah i think it, it's it's one of those situations where we can prioritize. There are some, you know, kind of uh, things that are happening to, you know, better insulate um, buildings and, uh, you know, kind of promote efficiency otherwise. But the heating and cooling systems are really important. It just will uh, take some time before um, all buildings can really benefit in a, in a cost effective manner too um, from heat pumps. Okay. So, um, one of the things that's coming up is that somebody's asking about whether there's any introductory literature for those those people who actually find the peer-reviewed journals pretty inaccessible to understand so if you if you come up with examples of things people could read <clears throat> about these issues just just throw them into the discussion um but while we're going along let's let's move away from the united states a little bit and think about the global south where the effects of climate change are predicted to be vastly worse and uh, we worry about what's been going on in europe of course and what's been going on in parts of North America, but actually the impacts of climate change in the tropics is expected to be uh, terrifying in terms of what they might do. Can you say a little bit about this and from the point of view of um, heat and, and are there are there different strategies for challenge uh, for the challenges that people are affecting uh, facing in those areas that you think we people should be aware of? Are there ways in which maybe they're already figuring it out for themselves because they're already at a more extreme in a more extreme environment? in terms of heat and humidity. To, uh, should I start on that one? Sure. Uh, you know, okay. Um, yeah, the, you know, great, great question. I mean, I think any, any conversation uh, around the global South really has to start with acknowledging, generalized, generally speaking, how much more fossil fuel emissions we've had um, you know, in, so much of the, in so much of the North, how much we've benefited um, uh, economically. So when you hear about the need to not blow through the one and a half degree target, um, there are some really challenging issues there, major policy questions. You know, if we say no to, to natural gas everywhere, what does that mean for some of these, these countries that really haven't been responsible for hardly any uh, emissions? And, but, you know, pivoting to the heart of the question, they are in many ways the most vulnerable, not just because some of the climate hazards are worse, but because of less adaptive capacity, generalizing again, sometimes not as strong um, uh, institutions uh, and, and other reasons. Um, so yeah, I mean, heat and humidity, very high in a lot of parts uh, of the tropics. Um, so I was just yeah. gonna say, I mean, one of the other questions is around Indonesia, yeah. where the humidity is higher, the temperature is higher. Are there ways you can learn from these other countries because they've already got to the point that America hasn't quite got to yet in terms of how to, I mean, we always think about how we're going to explain things to the world or figure things out for the world, but actually maybe the world has figured it out and we should be learning from them in our climate score. Yeah, I mean, I think I'd, I'd love to go to, to the other speakers on that. I think there's there's always so much to learn. Um, I don't frankly know know the answer to that question, but one thing to keep in mind is those countries are being pushed rapidly um, you know, towards the brink in many ways. Um, and because the natural variability is sometimes lower, just having the wet bulb temperature go up by one degree um, can get you in the tropics to 
unprecedented extremes because the historical variability has been less and because that one degree nudge gets you closer to a threshold like um, 35, 35 Celsius. So yeah, the vulnerabilities are, are, are really high, but maybe maybe turn to some of the other other speakers for, for their thoughts yeah. on, on strategies and, and other, other place, other parts of the world. I have a couple thoughts. Um, you know, I think that even hot, humid areas, as you mentioned, Riley, are getting more hot and more humid. And it's interesting. I took care of a gentleman um, in his 60s who was from Guatemala, and he was coming in with heat illness. And he says, you know, I did all the right things. I was resting during the heat of the day. I was drinking water, and I still got sick. And I had to, you know, I had to sort of explain sort of the teachable moment in the emergency room of like, the climate that you grew up with is not the climate of today, right? And so even if people think they're heat acclimated, that might even be more dangerous, right? Because they're like, oh, I know what to do with heat. I'm from the tropics, right? So, so they're, they're definitely are still very vulnerable. One of the things that I see sort of, um, you know, the global South having that, that maybe we don't have is, is the community cohesion, um, and the ability for, for neighbors to look in on each other, right? And we know that social vulnerability is one of the leading risk factors for people getting sick and dying during heat waves. Um, and so they have a community cohesiveness that I think many of us realize that we don't necessarily have here. Some of us have that, and that's that's a blessing. But many of us, you know, live in neighborhoods where we don't really even know who lives next door or above us or below us, right? And, and that seems to be less of an issue in many parts of the world where people have way more uh, social reliance on those who are living in their communities and neighborhoods, um, which becomes a bigger issue when they get affected by extreme events and they're forced to leave those communities, right? Because that social network is what really keeps people alive. People really depend on each other for so many resources. But I think we can learn a lot about that and, and try to relearn um, how to have sort of social intelligence about about our neighborhoods and, and looking after each other and um, and looking after humanity. So, Diana, did you want to add anything? I'm sure. I think it's presumptuous to assume that we know we have all the answers, right? I mean, I think that there are so many ways of knowing. And I, I was in Puerto Rico, um, where my family kind of, uh, or you know, like my ancestors are from, my my grandmother, my father, etc. Um, and I, I went to, we went to visit um, a local uh, community organization that was like planting mangroves because they realized that it was the environmental stewardship that had like kind of somehow uh, been in decline and that they wanted to like rehabilitate not just their relationship to the environment, but also realizing that the mangroves were being destroyed by man for, you know, like man-made causes essentially. Um, and it was a, such a, it's a, such a technically small thing, right? I mean, they're literally like, pan, uh, you know, seeding and then growing and then planting the mangroves, but doing so much in terms of flood mitigation and re kind of um, establishing uh, pathways uh, to address the kind of, um, flooding and, and storm surge concerns and Puerto Rico, because it's been affected again and again by kind of various storms, they really have to have, they, they have to figure it out. And they're not just figuring it out from a mangrove perspective. Like that's a small um, scale intervention that's very much kind of community driven. It's connected to culture and dance and music and language and all of the things in terms of connecting to even an, an Afro Puerto Rican uh, tradition too, um, they, they, there's also a lot of work around energy sovereignty happening in Puerto Rico, trying to figure out how to increase access to solar and really thinking about resilience and, and you know, microgrids and other things. And, and I think that we have to be kind of learning not just from, from those communities, because they have a certain sense of urgency around it. But they're also thinking about these issues and their solutions more holistically and not just looking for the silver bullet that will do it. And I really believe that that's our job. Like our job is to listen, to learn, and to be humble enough to realize that we're not the only ones that think about these issues and that have ideas and that have potential solutions. Um, and so, yes, I invite the, you know, the notions that uh, Global South um, you know, kind of needs to, their, their voices need to be heard, their voices need to be appreciated, uh, elevated, um, and also that we have to trust the knowledge that they're coming with. So uh, we're going to wrap this up in a second. Diana, just 
people are asking about things they can read. Tell us about your book event on Friday. Can you quickly, in, in one sentence, tell us how, how do people find out about this or get to it? So we'll have to probably do another one at Columbia. This one is a closed event because it's oh, for readers. Uh, these are our reviewers that have read, uh, that are reading uh, the, the manuscript um, that isn't right. yet published. Uh, it's being hosted by the Russell Sage Foundation, but uh, look out, Powerless, the people struggle with energy and security in America should be coming out this uh, this year and looking forward to having some book events at Columbia for sure. Sounds great. So I like to joke that the climate school is the oldest climate school in America that's only two years old, whereas the School of Public Health has been around for 100 years. It's celebrating its centenary this year, which is fantastic. It's one of the first public schools, um, public health schools in the in the world. Um, and one of the things that uh, Cecilia is partly responsible for is this amazing consortium, uh, global consortium. So if you want to get information on, um, you know, in, informing your opinions about climate change and what's happening with health, go on the website, look into public health at Columbia and actually look at the global consortium of climate and health education courses. Uh, you're welcome to join. Uh, there's stuff that you can sign up for right now. And so you can feel, uh, feel free to, to, to gain access. And uh, let us know if you have any difficulty with that. I now have to wrap this up, I'm afraid. It's been a wonderful evening. I'd like to thank all three of you. You've been astonishing, Diana, Bradley, and Cecilia. So wonderful to have you speaking so eloquently and with such uh, impressive knowledge about this unbelievably difficult uh, series of issues that we're facing. The Climate School, of course, is about trying to bring people together in these transdisciplinary teams to tackle some of the toughest problems we face with the climate crisis, the biggest challenge of the 21st century. And we're gearing up to do more and more uh, going forward. We really need your support. And so uh, we're keen to engage in a variety of ways. But if you can also think about supporting the Climate School, uh, that would be really greatly appreciated. Uh, in the meantime, I'd like to thank everybody again. Thank all everybody who, who's been listening in. And I'd like to also particularly thank the people who submitted questions. That's been really helpful. Thank you very much and look forward to seeing you again in the, in the near future. Bye. Thank you. Bye.